considering the things we can learn and just some short thoughts from a text in Ephesians chapter 3 tonight. Like was mentioned this morning and like we've been doing for the past few weeks here in the month of December, we've considering the topic we've been considering, well that was a very East Texas thing to say, we've been considering the topic of prayer and especially on Sunday evenings we've been looking at different examples of prayer in scriptures. We a few weeks ago looked at the message of the model prayer and things we could look into even think about the importance of using that prayer whether we specifically say that as long as we make sure our minds and our hearts are behind the things that are being said in that prayer whether we look at it in matthew 6 or in luke 11 when jesus disciples ask him how to pray we can use those things to help us guide our thoughts and as we approach the throne of god we also looked last week at second or excuse me at first kings chapter 8 just the prayer there that Solomon prays as he dedicates the temple. A lot of that prayer focused on the fact that about when people sin and find themselves in consequences because of that sin, that when they realize the mistakes that they've made and they repent of those things and they think about the temple and what the temple represents of God's presence and God being there among his people, that God would forgive his people and that he would show them mercy and grace in those times, as well as just some things about the greatness of God, about the fact that God would be so um, popular, probably isn't really the right word, that is really, really a downplay there, but there in 1 Kings chapter 8, this idea that even the Gentiles around, or the, those who are not of God's people around, would know of the Lord, and would come there to the temple to learn of God, as we see that ultimately happening in Jesus, the one who is the ultimate fulfillment of God dwelling with his people, God in flesh himself being there dwelling among his people, and people from all over the world, not just the Jews, but all people coming to God, coming to God and finding salvation in him. This evening I want to be in Ephesians chapter 3 and look at this prayer, just the final few verses of this chapter, particularly in verse 14 through the end of the chapter in verse 21. Uh, we'll, Look at the first half of the chapter and read that just to get a kind of a running start into our text for this evening in just a moment. But if you look in your Bible, some of you may have some type of passage heading over certain paragraphs or sections of Scripture. Some of you may not. But if you do, some of you might have something like spiritual strength or a prayer for spiritual strength here in Ephesians chapter 3, right there around verse 14, above verse 14. This idea that Paul's praying for the people in Ephesus that they would have strength, that they would find strength in Jesus Christ. We're going to look at some of the things that Paul says within this prayer. Just a couple of observations this evening before we continue on in our service together tonight. As I think about this idea of spiritual strength, we're not talking about necessarily physical strength. We look at people and feats around us to show off human physical strength. In just a few months... In the next year, we're going to be seeing the Winter Olympics, which isn't quite the same as the Summer Olympics. I'm not really much of a which Olympics is better because I'm not really much of an Olympic watcher. But I can appreciate the fact that these are athletes and people who have trained and worked very hard in the sports that they play. And whether, you know, even if you're not lifting weights or throwing stones or throwing discs or spears or javelins, it takes strength to be someone who's going to be a well-rounded skier or someone who's going to be able to cross-country ski or someone who's going to be able to, I guess even curling probably has some type of strength as far as muscle control as you've got to do those things you do with curling. But we're not talking about physical strength. This evening. We're talking about spiritual strength, the strength that you and I need on our everyday walk of faith. As we want to serve the Lord and follow the Lord, we want to see what Paul has to say about spiritual strength in this text tonight. Let's get that running start. And to our prayer, we see Paul giving this evening by looking at Ephesians chapter 3. And let's read these first 13 verses. Paul has come off of the first chapter, just the Jeff O'Rear summary of all the blessings or the fact that God has had this plan of redemption for his people to bless people in Christ. And he goes into chapter 2 then from all that message in chapter 1 and chapter 2 to talk about the fact that we have been changed and we have been made alive. And we are no longer separate and distinct as different groups of people, but Christ has unified us and brought us together, no longer Jew and Gentile, but all people able to be together in the church. Paul goes on to say in chapter 3, For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, know or how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, 
as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This is the mystery, in verse 6, this is the mystery that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I am very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So, I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. To summarize a little bit of that, there seems to be some concern for Paul. You notice in chapter 3, verse 1, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus. This is one of Paul's prison epistles. We sometimes refer to it as with some of the others where he writes from being in prison. And as he writes this, there seems to be, as we look at the connection to verse 13, maybe some concern of the Ephesians worrying about Paul in some way. But within all of this, Paul is getting to the fact that he has been blessed with this grace from God in order to proclaim what he refers to as the mystery. The mystery really being the fact that all people can come to salvation. You don't have to be a law-keeping Jew. You can come to find salvation through Jesus. Not just come to find salvation however you want. It's through Jesus Christ. Jews and Gentiles, all people find salvation in this way. Paul has been blessed to teach people like the Ephesians this message, to go like he does in his other missionary journeys and proclaim this message. And with that understanding of what he's done and what he's been through and where he is right now, we get to our prayer for this evening. Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 14. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul begins this prayer in verse 14 as he mentions the fact that he is praying for the Ephesians. As I think there's a the times when Paul does this, whether it's the Thessalonians or the Ephesians or other people that he writes to, that we could understand that these are things that we could either pray for other people or hopefully people will pray for us. Understand that people are bowing their knees and going to God, and as he addresses God in verse 15, the one from whom every family on heaven and earth is named. This idea that all people have been made by God, that God is the creator of all people. All are made in his image. And this is one of the things that Paul prays for. According to God's riches of his glory, that he might grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. He wants the Ephesians to find strength. And again, not the strength they need in order to go and to shoot a gun and then ski a little bit farther and then shoot a gun some more, or not in order to you know, win the hockey game, not the physical strength like we see shown off in Olympics summer or winter, but the spiritual strength, this inner strength that's provided by his spirit. I think we could interpret that in a way to say that as we spend time with his spirit that has been shown and revealed and kept and preserved for us through his word, that we will be strengthened and encouraged as we learn from the teaching of God's word and what is said within the pages of scripture as his spirit has inspired those things, that we would find that strength and blessed by our father, our creator, to have that strength. He goes on in verse 17 to also say, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. This morning in our class, we talked a little bit about this idea of that, that Paul prays for the Thessalonians that their hearts will be directed to the love of God and the patience of Christ. This is a similar phrase to that, I think, in this idea of, well, how does that happen? How does Christ dwell 
in my heart? How does the man who hung on the cross, how does the God who was there before creation, as it talks about in Colossians chapter 1, who was involved in creation, is the creator of all things, how does he dwell in my heart? Well, that's obviously not talking about a physical, I don't know how big a heart is. We'll say it's about this big. I was going to give a dimension, but I don't know, so I'm just going to not say. It's about a fist, Becca is telling me, to think about that. How would God, how would the Lord encompass this? Well, as we look at what's said in there, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Again, we're not really talking about physical things. We're talking about this idea of spiritual strength and our inner man, our inner being. It reminds me, it gives me a similar idea to this idea in chapter 4 and verse 24. It's across the page for me. You might have to turn or you might have to hit the next button on your phone or tablet. But in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 24, we're told to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. This idea that God would dwell in our hearts through faith, I think is the fact that we have faith in the Lord and trust, again, in the teachings of his word and believe them to be true, and that we would then look to model our lives after the life and the example and teachings of Jesus and of our Father, our Creator, that this new man that we have, this place where Christ is going to dwell, is a place that's modeled after the Lord and his teachings, that that's the type of example, that's the type of thing that Paul is praying for the Ephesians, that we should want as well, that we would be people, that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith. He continues the thought, though, back in chapter 3 and verse 17. There's lots of that's and so that's here within this text. He mentions in verse 16, he's praying to God, that we would be, according to the riches of his grace and glory, be strengthened through the power of his spirit in our inner being, so that, verse 17, Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that, we continue on, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Let's pause there for a second. I don't know exactly where to put the thought break. And maybe it's like we mentioned again in class this morning, we shouldn't be so hard to say, well, the comma is here or the period is there. Let me look at this whole idea. That we would be rooted and grounded in love, Paul says. This is an agricultural term and then some type of engineering term or that we would have a good foundation. Be rooted would be this idea, think of a plant. And we're thinking about we want to be like a very big, strong tree with deep, strong roots in the love of God. And this idea we'd be grounded and have a good, solid foundation in the love of God as well. And as we have that good, solid foundation and those good, strong roots in love, that we would have the strength or the ability to try to comprehend, this is the ironic thing, isn't it? To comprehend the breadth and length and height of depth to try to know the love of Christ, which ironically, he says, surpasses knowledge. How does that happen? Again, we're not talking about physical things. How do I hold within my brain all of the right textbook answers to pass the test at the end of the semester about the love of Christ? What does that mean? I don't think we can. Do you know the song? Do you know the lyric? Where the ocean's filled with ink and every stalk on earth a quill. The skies were all scrolls and everyone was scribes by trade. All the time in the world, all the people, all of us working day and night, 24-7, 365, to write about the description of God love. We've run out of ink in the ocean. We've run out of scroll space in the sky and the universe. So we think about being rooted and grounded in that love. But you still have a desire to know that love, don't you? You know, sometimes we are overwhelmed with things and knowledge. As I maybe think about to some of my college days and trying to study and cram that information for the end of the year semester test, something like that. If I haven't been doing that and I have an entire semester's worth of work to learn in three days before the final, Jeff O'Rear just throws up his hands and says, it'll be what it'll be, right? And I just kind of fill in the bubbles on the test, kind of guess my way through and work my way and, and that's just how it works. But when it comes to God, we don't just throw up our hands and give up. We know that it is an incomprehensible topic or subject, the love that God has shown you and me, unworthy people of his grace and mercy and of his son's blood, but yet still sent his son for you and I to be able to have salvation. And through that, that we would be motivated to still 
come to know that love, that we would be rooted and grounded in that love as we are concerned about other Christians and their labors, as we're considered or concerned maybe about our own struggles, as there may be disunity, there may be problems within a local congregation that appear to be happening in a congregation like the church in Ephesus, that we would be rooted and grounded in that love and would be motivated by that love to continue to learn more and more about that love. That as we think about maybe our passage from this morning, our phrase, your phrase you have to, this is your homework for the week, right? What was the phrase you have to remember? That God's grace is sufficient for us. Tied in with that is the topic of God's love, you know, God's love that he has shown to you and me. And that we would be, come to know that love and dwell on that love and find strength in that love. And then finally in verse 19, that you may be filled with all the fullness of of God. Again, surprise, surprise, not a physical thing. If I was filled with all the fullness of God, I'd probably be obliterated from his power and majesty and holiness. Be filled with the fullness of God, I think, again, trying to be more like my Heavenly Father, more like my Lord in the example of his life and his teachings and the things that he has said. All of this, again, is not really about physical things. It's about the spiritual things and the strength that we would develop, that we would have over time, maturity, and looking at examples of people like Paul, people around us, especially looking at the teachings of God's Word and growing through the teachings that we find there, that we would find spiritual strength. As you look at this prayer, think about this prayer this week. Maybe if you go back and you review notes or review passages, go back and review Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through verse 19, and think about the fact that I'm looking for spiritual strength. And I'm always looking to grow in spiritual strength. This is not just a newbies class. This is not just a partway, halfway through class. This is a newbie, mature, just became a Christian yesterday. I've been a Christian for 70 years. We all can go back and look for spiritual strength and be encouraged from the strength that Paul has to mention within this prayer. But he doesn't actually conclude the prayer or really conclude the whole thought of the first three chapters until we get to verse 20 and verse 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. It sounds like a lot that type of strength that we're looking for, that we're striving for here in Ephesians chapter 3. That sounds like a lot of work. That sounds like a lot of responsibility. But as we've talked about before, and as the scriptures talk about, it's not just up to us. It's not even just up to this local church. There are great people in this room, but we can't attain the level of all of this without the help and the strength of the Lord. Now, that's been pointed out really already in some of the texts we've looked at in verses 14 through 19. But especially here, I want to focus on this thought in verse 20. To him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, which really isn't our power but his power, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. May we continue to look to God for help to grow in his love, to grow in our love for him, I guess I should say, to grow in our knowledge of him, to grow in our strength as we work in his kingdom. And we have to understand that those two go together. We want strength so we can work in his kingdom. I don't want strength so I can sit more comfortably in my chair in his kingdom. I want to work in his labor or in his vineyard, in the fields of his kingdom, that I would be able to bring glory and honor to him throughout all generations. May this be some prayers, some thoughts really from Paul and to encourage us to grow in spiritual strength this week. And may this be a prayer that we look at to, look back to, maybe think about how can I use some of these thoughts or some of these words from Scripture in my own prayers, the things that I pray with my mind and with my heart as I want to grow and be strengthened spiritually. This evening as we conclude our lesson, as we turn to the invitation for tonight, it may be that you are looking for a way to come back to the Lord. Maybe there's someone here this evening who needs to come to the Lord for the first step. They need to take that first step in becoming a Christian, to be in Christ, to have those blessings. You know that God's plan is to redeem you. You understand and have read in scriptures and see that he has sent his son to save you from your sins. You know you are not worthy of that, but he has done that out of his grace and mercy. And you're ready to respond to be born again 
You respond to the salvation that's offered through his grace and the faith that we have in that. And you're ready to be baptized and to start that new life. Maybe you have started that life, but you have fallen off that path. And you don't need to come back to God. If you're going to find spiritual strength again, it's going to be through him and through the forgiveness that he has to offer. This evening, you can take that step to come back to the Lord. It's a, it can be a difficult step. Can we all acknowledge that? Those who struggle spiritually, it can be a difficult step. But we want to encourage you this evening that if you need to take that step, take that step tonight. Come back to God. Let us encourage you and help you this evening, whatever you can. Meet me at the front while we stand and while we sing.